Okay. Thanks. It's the last session of the morning. I'm sure you're kind of getting ready for lunch. Your tummies are maybe grumbling. So um, we'll keep it focused and hopefully um, some of this will resonate. Um, I, I was asked to, to um, present on the relationship in professional education. And uh, Morris and I had a conversation maybe about a month ago, and I've been working on it since then. And as ever, there's probably more I could talk about rather than less. So I, I'm going to try and focus in on mostly macro issues and a few micro, or mostly micro issues and a few macro issues. And I'll explain what I mean with, with that. But I'll start with the conference aim, and I'll link to what I hope we can accomplish. Um, in, in the next 45 minutes. The conference aim is, in part, to commence a dialogue in pursuit of synergies and unified practice with recognition of the centrality of relationship as the core of all of our work. So how does what we're going to do in the next 45 minutes link in with that? I, I want to explore the role and process of professional education in supporting the central core of relationship, linking the language to above in our work with children, young people, their families, and each other. And so to do that, I'm going to cover a little bit of ground. I'm going to tell you about a study that I'm currently involved in. I hadn't really planned to talk about this study, um, but actually the findings of this study speak directly to the topic, and so um, it fits very nicely. I'm also then going to kind of spend some time exploring how we teach relationship, because I think that for me is a central question in grappling with um, pre preparing for t today. And then I'm going to offer some implications for pedagogical practice. And by pedagogical practice, for this session, I'm talking about um, the pedagogy of um, professional education and training, rather than social pedagogy of supporting the development of people in their life spaces. But before I get to the, to the study, which is the first part of the structure, I want to step back and say, well, who are we? And I had to think about that, like, who are the we that we're talking about? And I'm going to propose that the thing that maybe unifies us, again, to draw from the language of the conference aim, is um, the fact that we work with children, young people, families. If you're a social pedagogue, you, you may work with adults as well in their life space, and maybe even increasingly from a life space perspective. Um, and so in saying what I mean by that. I'm going to draw from the work of Garibaldi and Stewart talking about life space as a unified space consisting of not just the physical, so I don't just mean those of us who worked in residential childcare where we kind of had control of this little bubble, this life space that, that we um, created for, for children who couldn't live with their families of origin, but actually it has a mental, virtual, and relational dimensions in which the life of the child, young person, or family unfolds. Um, and if you're not familiar with their work, I highly recommend it. Um, all of the references are in the back of the, of the PowerPoint. I'm happy to make this available. Um, and they did write an article for us for the Scottish Journal of Residential Child Care. It's freely available electronically. So I um, highly recommend their work. So we who work with people in their life spaces. Um, so. I'm going to tell you about threshold concepts for a couple of minutes, and it's going to feel a bit like pinball, but I promise I'll signpost and, and keep the threads connected. So in any sort of professional education, there are core concepts that need to be taught, and there isn't always consensus about what those core concepts should be. And we're experiencing that in Scotland, who, where it's been decided that a certain level of qualification is going to be required for people to register in order to work with children and young people and keep their registration. Um, and yet there's debate about what should go into that. And I, I would say there's even something more important than core concepts, and that is threshold concepts. And they are a type of core concept. Um, but actually, they go beyond just kind of the building blocks of what you got to learn in order to be a good economist or a good mathematician or a good child and youth care worker because they open up a whole new way of thinking that was previously inaccessible before you started to get your head around the concept. And they can be thought of as a portal or a threshold through which you go through to another level, not just of understanding, but I would suggest of being, especially in our field. So there's five characteristics 
at least two more have kind of been kicked about. But to keep it simple, there's five characteristics identified in relation to threshold concepts. They're transformative, and this is the most important. When you really get a threshold concept, it transforms how you are and how you think. Um, it's irreversible. Once you really get it, you can't unlearn it. You can't forget it. They're integrative. They help you understand other aspects of your discipline or of your field in ways that you weren't able to do before you got your head around this concept. They're bounded in that they help to define the scope or boundaries of a subject area. And they're troublesome. They're sometimes hard to get. They can be counterintuitive. And often, when a student or an early stages practitioner is struggling to get their head around a threshold concept, they'll mimic understanding before they actually get it. And so you may work with newbies, or maybe people who never get it, who are mimicking an understanding of certain aspects, maybe aspects that you hold dear in practice, but they don't really get it. And so I was really interested in this as a way of understanding how we can inform the development of curricula. I'm making noise with that, aren't I? Sorry. <laughs> the development of curricula that will actually make a difference for those people who are out there in direct practice, and especially for those people in receipt of their direct practice in terms of their care experiences and in terms of the improvement of their life chances. And so we decided to do a study. I think that I have one more slide telling you about threshold concepts. Yes, yeah, so when, when you start getting your head around the threshold concept, you go from very basic compartmentalized understanding that, to something that's more foundational, coherent, acquisition of new. So once you start to get some threshold concepts, acquiring new knowledge becomes easier and more integrative. And people experience not just an extension of language and discourse. Mark talked a lot in the previous session about discourse. But also, people have a shift in their identity and their whole worldview. So this may be recognizable to you if you've been through some thresholds of your own in terms of your education and practice. So there's substantial empirical evidence about threshold concepts in higher education. Um, drawn from over 80 disciplines or subject context, but it hasn't ever been applied to child and youth care, residential child care, social pedagogy. It's just beginning to be applied to social work. Um, and so we thought it would hold potential in shifting discourses about residential child care in ways that are, are helpful to that. Where's the back button? Sorry. <laughs> there we go. So we got a little, a little pot of money from the Higher Education Association. And we decided, and it's just a scoping study, but we decided to um, look at whether or not there are these threshold concepts um, in residential child care, child and youth care. Because it's such a small study, we didn't bring into our sample social pedagogues, although I think the next level of study, we would really like to include social pedagogy as well in the study. So we had focus groups of so-called expert educators. These are people who um, educate in child and youth care or residential child care or therapeutic child care, um, as well as are well published in terms of contributing to the development of theory, the development of evidence, um, and the development of practice. We then had focus groups with what we called student practitioners. These are people who are newly graduated. Um, so they've recently been through a course, at least within the, the last couple of years, and they're out there in practice. Um, or they're at the later stages of their education, but they've already been in practice. So some courses are for people already in practice. Other courses, you do the course first before you get into practice. So they had to have a fair bit of their education, if not completed it and a dedicated education, either in residential child care or child and youth care, but also have at least started into practice trying to apply their learning to their practice. We are just now starting on the individual follow-up interviews with a subset of the student practitioner focus group participants. And we'll be doing traditional dissemination, meaning we'll write some articles and we'll write a report. But we're also going to create an online learning object for the learning zone based on the, the findings, uh, a handbook, and we'll put on a free webinar to try to make the findings available as widely as possible and as usefully as possible. So 
I'm going to be brief about the preliminary findings. I'm going to start connecting them now to what should this tell us about relationship in professional education. Well, <laughs> um, we used an online platform for the focus group so that we could include people from North America as well as from the United Kingdom. Um, and, it, and it was a really small pot of money. I would have much preferred to have a much bigger study and, and include um, people from further uh, abroad as well or from mainland Europe, and hopefully we'll do that soon. Um, but already with <laughs> such a small study, I was sitting there like simultaneously fascinated and going, God, this is great, and going, what am I going to do with this data? And it's going to be like herding cats. And I, I really love cats. But I don't want to hurt them, you know? And people were thinking so expansively and bringing in all different kinds of things. And identifying and clearly demarcating threshold concepts is going to be like herding cats, as I've put there. The other thing is, and we have one of the founding theorists of threshold concept theory on our, on our steering group, thank goodness. And he said in one of our steering group meetings, he said, you know, we're shifting our thinking away from just threshold concept to threshold area of practice or threshold area of learning. And I think for our field, I think that's really helpful. And I, I think I would have pushed it in that direction anyway, but with a lot less confidence than, I think I need to move this down, than with a lot less confidence than I'm going to now that I kind of have permission from like a key figure in that, that actually it's a threshold area of practice or a threshold area of learning and probably in our field again, they're, they're both combined. But when we started doing the focus groups with the student practitioners, it was far less exploratory, far less covering, because they were in such early stages and they were less confident um, about that process. And that was also where I was really becoming more convinced of shifting away from just a, a neat, tidy concept to more an area of practice. But both sets of focus groups had the top two most dominant themes. And it probably doesn't come as a surprise, but there was still something quite exciting about having that confirmed, which is relationship and self. And actually, separating out the two is going to be impossible anyway. But, um, but sometimes in creating spaces for people to learn and develop, you need to, to try and organize things. And so we have this tension. But relationship and self were the, the most dominant themes for both, in different ways, interestingly. And so our follow-up interviews are now focusing in with students, practitioners, who, um, who are willing to talk to us about the troublesome nature of going through that threshold of going from how you used to understand relationships when you first decided to take the course or you first got into the field to how you understand relationships now. And I think what they're telling us has a lot to offer in how we think about how we educate and train people in order to do relationships. Because we talk a lot about relationships, but how do we do the educational relationship? And I think this is a central question that isn't very supported in, in certainly higher education environments. There's definite evidence so far, both from focus groups and now from um, the start of our follow-up interviews, that, that it is a transformative area. And I'm going to focus in primarily on relationship because that's the focus of the talk. And that is going to be the main focus of the, the remaining part of our study as well. Um, I, would, I was just in an interview this week with a young woman who was talking about, she did she, she was talking about how she used to think about relationship as if you had a good relationship with someone, then that just made the work a bit easier. And even how you define what the work is, like I know for some of us early days, the work was getting them to do what you needed them to do, right? And if you had a good relationship, that made it easier. And therefore, that was, some, that was how we thought about relational practice or relationship. Um, but now she's um, beginning to think that it was central to the work. And I'm, I'll be interested in how many students slash practitioners talk about it being the work. And maybe this will come clearer in, in a few slides. So there's, been, you, there's evidence of transformations in, in, um, in student practitioners talking about understanding the perspective of others and the profound nature of really being able to do that and its impact on relationship 
with that, of course, is understanding of self and the impact of self on that. Boundaries is coming up an awful lot. And understanding behavior and even just thinking about what the work is in relation to behavior and shifting away from a more behavioral focus. And by that, I, it could be just focus on behavior. It could be using behavioral theories to try to influence what children do to a more relational focus. But it's troublesome. Coming to really understand relationship and practice is troublesome and it's even painful. I was in an interview with a, a young woman who actually started crying in an interview as she talked about the breakdown in the relationship she had with a client and how she hadn't expected that and how it made her feel and how she was still in that troublesome aspect of even coming to define what a good relationship is and who has control over that. Um, boundaries, setting limits and boundaries and the whole effort away from punitive practice. Um, the everyday nature of the work, and boy, this came up a lot with the um, expert educators especially, but you could kind of hear it sometimes in the tentative nature of what our student practitioners were saying is that actually the power in what we do often comes in the minute stuff that we do, the minutia, right? Like it, just all those drops of water that carved the, the, that made up the Colorado River that carved the Grand Canyon, right? And each drop in itself is nothing, but if each drop was part of that collective. And I, I think that's very threshold as well. That's probably a, a different area of threshold learning. But it relates to the relationship and the minutia in building the relationship, the, minu the minutia within the relationship that actually has the impact. Um, the stuff of the self, Power of vulnerability coming through notions of professionalism is huge and notions of what it means to have a professional relationship or what it means to, to be professional in the context of relationships that actually sometimes demand intimacies from us. I, I genuinely believe that the kids that we work with sometimes have legitimate demands for intimacy from us and how do you square that with professionalism. So um, also less explicitly, but just in the background of what students were talking about was a struggle to take what they knew but couldn't put into words from the tacit to the explicit, both generally and relate in relation to the way they were making sense of relationship. And also from theory to practice. So for instance, attachment theory is huge, as Mark had mentioned earlier. And yet it's often very misapplied and not really that, that this big gulf between how does attachment theory actually change and understanding attachment theory change the way that you do what you do on the front line in a way that makes a difference to children and young people. Um, and so what theoretical influences actually can inform in a meaningful way how people make sense of their relationships, how people attempt to have healing compensatory relationships with children, young family and their and children, young people and their families. There's also some troublesome nature in the wider context of trying to teach relationship if we could actually do that. I'm going to read you a quote from um, Garibaji. It's not widely recognized that there is a relationship skill. In many practice settings, relationship based work is mandated by the policies and procedures of the employer. But there are no specific skills articulated to support this mandate. So many of our employers talk about what a relational, relational place this is or how relationships are so central. But actually for many employers, most of whom are not themselves professionals within the child and youth care field, relationship development is viewed as an innate skill, one that everybody has to some degree. And that is furthered primarily by effort and attention to the prescriptions of policies and procedures. So that wider context, if you're here yesterday, I, I was hearing that the, you know, the whole managerialist culture was being spoken about. And you can see how this technical rational notion of if you just learn the techniques or if you just follow the procedures, that's how you develop relational skills. And I think that there's probably a parallel in the way that we teach about relationship um, in our education and training. Adrian Ward, so that Garibaji is from Canada, he's talking about a Canadian context, but I think it's recognizable here in the UK. Um, I don't know about mainland Europe, um, but we could talk about it at, at lunch. Um, Adrian Ward, speaking from a UK context, talks about 
Although there is some recognition in the literature of the central role of the use of self in social work and other forms of professional practice, and especially its contribution to relationship-based practice, there is not much recent work on the question of how to educate practitioners for this aspect of their practice. So um, basically he's saying there's, there's not a lot out there that talks about this. He did subsequently write a chapter about this in, in the UK book. And I'm going to pull a bit from that chapter. He basically is making the argument that education for working in relationship, being really in relationship, isn't just about imparting information or teaching skills. And for the students, it's not just about you know, learning facts and, as Ward says, acquiring mechanical competencies. The educational experience must match up to the complex demands of relationship-based practice. And for that to be possible, we have to do what he calls matching. And he's talking about what he calls the matching principle. If you're not as familiar with that term, if you're familiar with parallel process, a very, very similar ground here, that we should aim for the felt experience of the learners to actually have certain correspondences with what it is that they'll be out there doing in practice. Core elements, he refers to them as. And so the matching principle for teaching about relationship and, and teaching relationship, he talks about, need to have some of these core elements. Placing a premium on working with the experience and process of the helping relationship. So not just talking about relationship in an indirect or in an abstract way, but actually talking about the relationships we're having here in the classroom or the relationships you're having out there on your placement or if you're out in practice, depending on what, where the training's happening or the higher education's happening. Attending to the emotional as well as cognitive elements of practice. And this is where threshold concept theory has a lot in common with the matching element because it really talks a lot about the emotional dimensions of learning and that they must be attended to if we're going to support students through the thresholds. Maximizing opportunities for helpful communication, and you can see that linking into his work on opportunity-led work if you're familiar with it, and kind of having a similar opportunity-led approach to um, to education, attending to the need for reflection at a deep level and creating spaces for that, focusing on the self of the worker and an emphasis on personal qualities and values. So th these are some of the matching principles for Ward. <clears throat> so when we're talking about relationship and relational practice, I need to step back and say, well, what do we mean by this? And I'm going to kind of shift and maybe be a bit more outward facing. So the focus of the last several slides is about like the experience of the student and the person responsible for facilitating that learning kind of in a classroom or some other training environment. Now I want to look outward in terms of this question about who are we and how is some sort of notion of unity amongst us, how can that contribute to the way we think about education. And I want to start just by thinking about the way that relationship is thought about in different traditions and looking at the differences and the similarities and how that might help inform how we go forward in trying to support and equip people newly entering the field to be able to have the kind of relationships that we know make a difference in the lives of children and young people. So I'm just going to offer you a few. Therapeutic communities, um, they have a sense of an awareness of how complex it is for children's, children to make new relationships and therefore how complex it is for the adults who make themselves a bit available for such relationships. And the crucial part of the care task is to provide young people with the op opportunities to really experience relationship in a different way than all the damaging ways that they may have before they came to that environment. Relationships that challenge, but also within which children can feel lovable, creative, worthwhile, and within which they can make sense of current and previous experiences. 
and the therapeutic child care um, course in Wrexham, um, a lot of their work is, is founded in the whole um, therapeutic communities literature. Rich talks about the history of the way we thought about relationship from a social work perspective. And that actually these early mod models were criticized for pathologizing, pathologizing service users, individualizing problems, and positioning the professional as the expert. And we know that's part of, part of the history. Um, and yet we threw the baby out with bathwater with a sh shift, significant shift to a predominantly socially oriented practice which then paid insufficient attention to the psychological dimensions of people's lives. We'll come back to then what's come since then in the efforts to, to revive that. But Garfa also talks a, a bit about the history of the way we thought about relationship in child and youth care. And he talks about the helper providing a certain kind of relationship. And even just in that verb, it's like, I'm in control and I'm providing the relationship to you. Therefore, it was thought about in terms of it being one way and out there. And it was almost instrumentally, and sometimes when you read some of the literature, and sometimes still, it's almost like a tool that you use. Well, if somebody's having a relationship with me and it's a tool that they're using to, towards some end, that immediately would make me uncomfortable. Um, Whereas being in relationship is different. It's different from having one and this recognition of mutuality and the co-creation of that relationship in what, what he talks about, the space in between. Back to relationship-based practice from a social work perspective. It's characterized by the understandings that human behaviors and professional relationships are integral. They are core. And that people are not simply rational beings. We have other dimensions that inform our behavior and the way that we experience one another, effective, both the conscious and unconscious, that not only complicate things, but they also enrich it. We wouldn't want to get rid of that. Internal and external worlds are inseparable, therefore our psychosocial responses are necessary. And relationship-based practice um, still characterized that each encounter, each individual is unique and therefore trying to pin down best practice in this field is very difficult. Collaborative relationship is the means through which interventions are channeled, requiring particular emphasis on the use of self. So again, much in common with other approaches in terms of therapeutic communities and CYC. And respect for individuals involves inclusive and empowering practice. Slightly different language, some similarities and some differences. And again, shifting back to a CYC focus, because I've been, I've been intrigued for a long time about is relationship-based practice and relational practice the same thing, but they just have, they come from different traditions, and so the language is different, or are they different? And, and Garfat would argue they're different. While focusing on the aspects of relationship substantiates the claim that one is using a relationship-based approach, it is my contention that the terms relational approach and relational practice refer to something different deeper and more complex. Relational practice involves a focus on the relationship while recognizing and respecting the characteristics of the individual involved in that relationship. Relational work, in contrast, attends to the relationship itself. So from a, a, deeply, orienti a deeply oriented relational practice perspective, the relationship that I'm having with you just now is the work. And I might even be checking in with you about how you're experiencing that relationship, what meaning you're making of how it feels in that relationship as part of the work. And this fits well with life space approaches to working with children and young people. I think it also fits well with upbringing, but I need to think about that further. So current conceptualization from a CYC perspective of relationship as co-created, connected, experiencing with the other from within the life space attending to the in-between between us, the relational, is different than attending to the content or even the process of relationship development. So actually, there's some argument that they're not quite the same. And it leaves me with a question about, do we try to unify this? Or is it appropriate that it, there are different um, subtleties in how we think about relationship de depending on what your role is and what your, your um, 
tradition is that you come from. And I don't, I don't have answers for that, but we could talk about it over lunch. So implications for pedagogical practice. Um, the use of self of the educator. And we, you know, the, the expert educators in the focus group talked a lot about use of self of the student and, and what a troublesome area of learning and practice that is. I would argue that it's just as troublesome area of learning and practice for us educators. And it's, there's less of an expectation that we actually work from this perspective and use this. I think there are those of us out there who are committed to this, but sometimes it feels like we're, <laughs> we're the exception. So parallel process here, emotional availability, presence of an authentic self, the ability to hold students in mind, having a commitment, being trustworthy, modeling. I think modeling is so much modeling about relationship in a way that um, supports the way that students experience that relationship and therefore develop relationships out there in practice. And I would, I would say not just relationships with children and young people, but relationships with fellow staff and other professionals. The language that we use, I think, is extremely important. I hear, I was listening to somebody last night talking about the language that was used in a place she was out consulting at. And I sometimes think about the language we use, either in the classroom or about what happens in the classroom. And even playfulness. How, how do we think about the role of play and playfulness in the educational or training setting? Um, and I guess it's something, just that slide up, is the work of relationship and how much more time it takes to approach things from either a relationship-based or a relational perspective. And that certainly doesn't get reflected in my workload allocation at my university, and I doubt it is reflected anywhere else. Um, so, and I would add to that, sometimes the hard work of relationships. So it's, it takes extra time when things are going well, but when things don't go well, how quickly we think a student is being a pain in the backside or we become dismissive, rather than actually seeing that as part of the curriculum. Just like we would want a practitioner to see some sort of relational conflict, to be part of the, we wouldn't maybe call it curriculum, but part of the process of learning how to do relationship. I don't know how often, and I'll put my hand up myself included, that when things get difficult with a student, that I think of, ah, relationship, and relish it. Actually, I'm like, ah, oh, one more thing, and I don't have time to deal with it. Why are they doing this? You know, oh. But I think we should challenge ourselves if we're truly committed to a relational perspective um, that we create the kind of relational spaces with our students that mirror the same thing in appropriate ways. It's not identical, it's just parallel. Further implications for pedagogical practice. Um, that article that I mentioned from Adrian Wardy talks about classrooms as holding environments and containment in the classrooms. And I could go off on another two hours talking about containment because it's one of my favorite subjects in the whole world, but I'm not going <laughs> to. But he talks about classrooms as holding environments. And part of that is the kind of relationships we have with children and young, or with, with our students also being containing. And by containing, I just mean the kind of relationships that people feel safe in that enables them to actually um, manage some of the troublesome nature of, of learning and education such that the whole thing is more manageable. But if you take that from the, rela the individual relationships with students to the whole classroom or training environment, and again, you could see the parallels to what it is we want our practitioners to do, right? So attending to the needs of the group and to the needs of the individual and the balancing between all of that. I would add to that, I was thinking about it in terms of considering the opportunities for the development of peer relationships. We were better at that back in Colorado when I was in practice there than we were in Scotland. In fact, peer relationships were really threatening to us in the places that I worked in Scotland. But um, actually considering the networking, we had a talk about networking last night as well, but considering the networking opportunities um, that students could have if we foster environments where it's safe for them to really connect in ways that enhance their personal fortitude, their understanding of what they're doing, their energy and enthusiasm, all that kind of stuff. 
And so it's not just me having relationships with students, it's fostering the kind of environment and processes where students have um, mutually beneficial relationships with one another, co-creating safety and challenge so that there's a good balance of both in the setting, sharing expertise, and really handing that over. So again, it's a co-created space. I don't come with all the answers and in control of the whole, whole agenda. At the, same, at the same time, I was thinking about Mark's point about intergenerational related to rearing. I do have different responsibilities than the, than the students in the classroom. I do have to mark their papers at the end of the day. I do sometimes have to fail students. It's, it's an, a horrendous part of the job, but to pretend like it's all equal and we're just doing, the, you know, isn't, so it's, it's, again, it's another parallel because it's out there in practice, the adults have more power. And in some respects, they should. But they should also mitigate against misuse of power or the unnecessary um, inversions of power. And I think similarly, we need to model that and work with that in our classrooms. Containing anxiety, making the, the whole classroom where f feelings are made more manageable, there are structures and processes that are predictable that help make things more manageable, and then this whole epistem epistemological um, containment, and I think that's big in education, and by that I mean creating spaces where people can really make sense of the troublesome area of the thresholds they're trying to get through. People can really make sense of the contentious stuff, the scary stuff that's going on back in practice or that they're about to go out and encounter. And also creating spaces, and actually that could fall under making sense, bringing the tacit to the ex explicit. What people already know but just haven't yet been able to put into words, I think that's a really big important part. And I think practitioners do that with kids and help kids to make sense of and bring what they already know into a more explicit and accessible form. Do I have time for this? I'll be very brief. Other possible, and this is just a question. So Jack Phelan, he's from the CYC tradition. He talks about frontline practitioners being experience arrangers and that our whole job is to orchestrate things such that young people have the opportunity to experience themselves differently, especially if they have a really negative self-script um, self inside their head. So sometimes for the first time, especially through the use of activities, which is where this is from, young people experience themselves as likable or capable or fun or trustworthy. And I wonder, especially for people coming to education who have had very poor experiences and do not see themselves as belonging here um, or not good at, at you know, school or that sort of thing, as creating spaces for people to experience themselves differently in relation to learning. And I think you might have something to offer us there. Again, I'll, I'll be very brief. I won't go into this deeply. But Jim Anglin, again coming from a CYC tradition, talks about 11 interactional dynamics that we should um, analyze in terms of how, how congruent organizations are working. And one of the layers is, is the external layer. So in terms of people being congruent in the best interest of children and young people, be, people coming singing from the same hymn sheet. Are we singing from the same hymn sheet in regard to listening and responding with respect? And in his book, he outlines what that would look like from the placing agency, external management, internal management, frontline practice, kids. And if everybody's singing from the same hymn sheet in terms of this interactional, relational dynamic, these are the kinds of things we'd expect to see. And I would argue we should add a bullet to each of those 11 and say, what would the educational and training environment look like for that local authority or for that country or that sort of thing. Um, further thought. Outward facing. What do we, <clears throat> as training and educator, training, people who train and do education, what do we need to do in terms of to support pedagogical practice for people doing the hard work of relationship? I think just still parallels, just like... Um, People in direct practice um, are doing advocacy for the young people that they work with. I think we have to advocate not just for individual students, but I think we have to advocate for the sector. And again, 
to um, challenge things like managerialist discourses that make it unacceptable to um, continue a relationship with a young person after they leave your care. Um, again, the language that we use at a more macro level in terms of how we write, um, the research that we do, and the connecting that we do in terms of um, interdisciplinary and I, I think different traditions, which is slightly different, through writing, through conferences like this one, through collaborative projects. Um, and I think we need to make space at this level to connect frontline practitioners, to, to give them opportunities to present at conferences and support them to do that, to um, support them to write for publication, um, to join the conversation at that level, as well as um, care, le care leavers, external managers, and even bringing pol policymakers into the mix. So I guess I kind of raised this already, but it, it, it makes me think what unifies us and how do we draw strength from that and how, do, how does that make our efforts all the more potent in making a difference in the lives of children and young people, um, but also what distinguishes us and how does that also benefit the process and, and how do we move forward with, with that? I'm not really sure, but that's the question I, I guess that leaves us with in the, the references at the end. So, Thank you for listening.